Are you constantly on the go? The newly updated Jesus Calling mobile app makes it easy to feel God's presence wherever you are. Read devotions and scriptures, purchase products, take notes, and so much more. The app is available for purchase on both Apple and Android. Download it today. With Jesus, He takes your soul pain. He takes your burden. I believe in a God that would actually want to do it for me and would want to take that. You believe it and you receive it and He takes it from you. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Life as a journey is almost cliche now, but there's a reason why the metaphor persists. Journeys are difficult. We fight through injuries, claw our way to the tops of mountains, and endure the elements. We enjoy the completion of one segment only to find another looming ahead with its own set of obstacles. Journeys are visions of life's failures and triumphs that emphasize the importance of keeping on. Our guests this week share how they've persisted and how Jesus has carried their burdens with them on their journeys. John Gordon overcame a negativity learned from childhood to become a highly sought after motivational speaker. But even with his success, he felt empty and a search for meaning led him to an unlikely source who told him that Jesus could take his soul pain away from him. Andrew Carter grew up in a family plagued with drugs and alcohol. After being in and out of jail multiple times, Andrew turned to Jesus long enough to be called to the ministry, but then he had what he calls a Jonah moment when he ran the other direction. Eventually, he found his way back to that calling as a social media influencer on platforms like TikTok and YouTube, where he shares the gospel with millions. For both John and Andrew, life has been a journey that's best done with Jesus. Let's start with John's story. So I grew up in a Jewish Italian family and my mom was Jewish. My dad was Catholic Italian, a lot of food, a lot of guilt, a lot of wine, a lot of whining. So it wasn't the most positive household, very loving, but my dad was one of the most negative people on the planet. He was a New York city police officer, undercover narcotics. So he was shot a few times. He wasn't very positive. And so I struggle with, positivity growing up and in my late twenties, so much so that my wife, she had enough of my negativity. She said, I I love you, but I'm not going to spend my life with someone who makes me so miserable. You need to change. I was 31 years old, two small children, stressed, fearful, negative, lost my job during the dot com crash. Don't know what our future holds. How am I going to pay the bills? definitely the most scary time of my life. And I was crumbling from the inside out. I had no faith and I really didn't know who I was. And I was so young and immature with two small children. And it was a wake up call for me. It was really a great ultimatum. Like, all right, she's going to leave. I love her. I want to stay married. I've got to change. And that began this journey of becoming a more positive person. So I started to research ways that I could be more positive. This was during the emerging field of positive psychology. And I read that you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. So I started to practice gratitude. I started these thank you walks where while you're walking, you say what you're thankful for. And those walks of gratitude also turn into walks of prayer. And so it was during those walks where I would start to say, God, please help me, God. God, show me the way, like just help me. And I just started to pray prayers. Now, again, I wasn't a believer at the time, but I always had this feeling that there was a God and that God cared about me and God was interested in my life and what I was doing. So I did feel this personal connection. Friends started to give me sermons and things to read. And Daniel Decker, who works with me to this day, he had been involved in in the church and, you know, really a strong believer gave me some sermons from a guy named Erwin McManus. And I read Erwin's, uh, actually listened to his sermon. Erwin is a pastor of Mosaic in LA. And I listened to his sermon, Why I Followed Jesus. And it just really spoke to me. For the first time, I felt his essence. I felt a connection to him for the first time in my life. Can't explain it. It was spiritual. It was beyond comprehension. But I felt it listening to Irwin's sermon. It brought Jesus to life for me. And I remember thinking, okay, maybe there is something to this Jesus. I'm open. So I said, God, show me the signs, God. Just show me the signs. If there is something to this Jesus, if he is who he said he is, just show me the signs. I'm open. 
and I started to look to see if any signs came my way. So at that time, I'm now speaking and I started you know, down the road of a motivational speaker. I started to give talks. And it's so funny because I'm giving these talks and people would come up to me and say, hey, you know, are you a believer? And I'd say, like a believer in what? <laughs> and no, you're a believer. Like you're a believer in God, like believer in Jesus. And I'd say, well, you know, no, not really. But for them, they said, oh, yes, you are. I see it in you. And other times people would come up to me and say, have you been saved? I know you've been saved. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't need saving. I'm, I'm good. But people were seeing it in me before I saw it in myself. But at this point right now, I'm on this journey. I'm, I'm seeking, I'm, I'm speaking. And when I said, God, show me the signs, I'm going down to Orlando to speak. And I'm driving in my car and I'm looking to the left and I turn to the right and there was a sign that said, Jesus is the answer. And that happened like three or four times, different places, different times. Everywhere I looked, I would see signs that say Jesus is the answer or, or got Jesus or you name it. And it just would show up. It was incredible how it happened so many times. And so I was seeing these signs and I'm like, okay, I'm seeing these signs. Like I asked God, show me the sign. And now I'm seeing these signs. So this is really wild. I go to a energy healer because I was having problems with my stomach and my colon and a lot of issues, a lot of health challenges. So I said, Don, I said, I've seen all these signs that say Jesus is the answer. What, what do you make of that? He said, well, you know, I'm a Buddhist. He said, but with Jesus, he takes your soul pain. He takes your burden. When he said that, it really got my attention. And he said, you know, all you do is believe and receive. He like, you believe it and you receive it. And he takes it from you. And it was wild because I walked out of there going, you know, I believe in a God that would actually want to take my burden, want to take my soul pain. He said, soul pain and that burden is sin. That's what Christians call it. He goes, I, talk, I call it soul pain. He said, but that's how it happens. I believe in a God that would actually want to do it for me and would want to take that. It made so much sense to me once he explained it that way. That was just amazing. So I walked out of there. I said, okay, I'm going to give this Jesus a shot. And I said, God, I don't have all the answers, but just strengthen my faith. And all these things just culminated in saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to surrender. And I realized that I, I needed a savior because I couldn't save myself. Like I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't good enough. It wasn't about my power. It was about transferring my power to the creator of the universe. And when I surrender and I give him my power, it's the great exchange. He gives me greater power. He gives me abundance. He gives me life, right? And so he changes everything. And so for me, it was like earth shattering. It was life changing. Who I am now is fundamentally so different than who I was because of this faith, because of this change, because of the surrender and just saying, okay, God, I surrender, save me. That's sort of part of the journey of, of how I came to Christ, how I definitely accepted him. And the coolest thing was I sent Erwin McManus a, an email about the experience and I didn't really know him, but I just sent him this email a week later I'm listening to his podcast because he was one of the first people doing podcasts and sermons like way back when this was 2006 or seven. And he's, he's reading my email to his audience and saying, Hey, here's a guy in Florida who found Jesus through a Buddhist energy healer. Most people think you have to find it in a church. It doesn't always work that way. God will use all ways and all means to reach you and connect you and to find the loss. And it was pretty cool because God used this guy, Don, who passed away a couple of years ago to speak truth into me in his own way, right? In his own way. I know that God has a plan. God has a purpose for everyone. And I know that for me, I'm meant to be in the marketplace. And so I need to speak secular language. And when I'm with companies and businesses, I'm talking about vision. I'm talking about purpose. I'm talking about optimism and belief. I do weave in faith. I talk about building great relationships. It's so funny because my main work is the power of positive leadership. The Energy Bus is my most popular book. Then there's the power of positive leadership. When I wrote this book, I measured it against Jesus, the way he led. 
And every principle in there is how Jesus led. It's just not using his language. It's love and accountability. It's building relationship. It's vision. It's belief. Jesus believed in people more than they believed in themselves. Look what he did with his disciples. And so I measured against his leadership and I did not put it into the book if it wasn't a principle that also embodied Jesus's leadership. So when I'm out there, I'm sharing how he led in a way, but I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the power of positive leadership. But what happens is as I'm out there talking and I share examples, people do then start to follow me. And as they start to follow me on social media and Instagram and Twitter, I am more bold with my faith, especially on Sundays. I will always share, you know, something that's really important to me from a faith standpoint. And then from there, you know, people might want to explore more. So that's how I've navigated in terms of, I go to give these talks and I want to be respectful of, of who they are, their organization, their business, and I'm there speaking, but I'm not denying myself or denying God by talking. I'm sharing the essence of who I am. I'm doing what God has called me to do. And I know that he's using me to speak life to these people, to encourage these people, to give them some light and some hope for the future. And then from there, they want more and they're interested in more, they, they seek more. And I think people need more of that to understand God's love. And there are people to talk about God's punishment and God all of all that, but they need to understand Jesus. And Jesus came to forgive, he came to love, he didn't come to condemn the world. And so once you understand that love, I think it makes you want to know more. And so I just wrote The Garden. And The Garden came out in uh, the spring during the pandemic. And this is my first sort of faith-based fable that I knew I had to write. God came to unite, right? He sent Jesus here to unite man back to God, to restore, to redeem what was lost, what was broken in the garden. And that is real unity, wholeness, oneness that, that we are meant to have in that relationship with our creator. So I had to put that in there. And I, I did. And I was like, man, like what, you know, like, all right, like there's no turning back, here you go. But it's pretty cool. I put a warning page in the beginning of the book as an introduction. This is not like my other books. We even promoted it with a warning a label. We shared the truth. This is John's faith that he's sharing in this book. We want you to know that. The book comes out and it's a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. And it's amazing when you honor God, he will honor the work. And it has impacted so many people already in a short amount of time being out to help people win the battle of their mind, their heart, and their soul for what they're going through. So it's a sweet story, it's really special, and people said it really spoke you know, to their soul. You know what? People need more encouragement today. They need more hope. They need more light. It's what Jesus came to do. It's what we need. We need the good news. And so I love Jesus Calling, by the way, and I have read all the books, and they speak to me in so many ways, and they strengthen your faith and you know what, it's funny because there are people in the world that will criticize and say, well, you're not sharing this enough. You're not giving the hard news. It's all fluff. It's all positive. And I believe that those people who are criticizing need to understand that they're not God and that God has a greater plan and God is using people in different ways. And you have to understand what his calling for you is. And if God calls me to be overt and to be bold, I will be bold. To learn more about John Gordon or to purchase his latest book, The Garden, a spiritual fable about ways to overcome fear, anxiety, and stress, visit johngordon.com. Stay tuned to Andrew F. Carter's story after a brief message. Give the moms in your life a beautiful gift of encouragement, reassurance, and peace this spring. The brand new Jesus Calling for Moms features devotions from Sarah Young's New York Times bestseller, Jesus Calling. Inside, you'll find 50 devotions that speak to the power of love, the gift of strength, trusting God's guidance, and so much more. Also included is a prayer for moms written by Sarah Young, plus Bible verses, as well as journaling prompts and space for moms to write their own prayers. Order Jesus Calling for Moms today wherever books are sold. Our next guest is Andrew Carter, a pastor and social media influencer. Though his childhood set him up for a turbulent cycle of drugs, prison, and street fights, his story also includes moments of success, overcoming drugs, earning multiple college degrees, and running a successful business. Unfortunately, 
Andrew's deep sense of emptiness brought on by his childhood trauma kept him going to dark places for escape. In the aftermath of a low season, Andrew recorded a short TikTok video of the different things God had taken him through. Hundreds of people responded saying things like, if you can go through these things and still be smiling, I can too. Now Andrew is talking regularly to his nearly 1 million followers, sharing insight on the importance of not giving up on God because he hasn't given up on us. I had to grow up really quick. My entire family is riddled with drug addiction, you know, prison stints and abuse. So it wasn't anything that I wasn't used to. So at the age of 11, I had lost one uncle to an overdose. My other uncle had spent 75% of his life in prison, in and out of jail. My grandmother struggled with alcohol abuse at one point. So the environment that I grew up in was filled with drugs and alcohol and partying and sex and all of those things. It was just kind of the norm. So at 11, Seven years old, I did have a pretty good understanding of this isn't good. As a kid, I believe that a lot of us just emulate our environment. We see and, and we imitate. So monkey see, monkey do, in a sense, that's what they were doing. And at that young age, that was the exact same path that I set out on. And um, at 17 years old, I was introduced to Jesus. I was trying to date this girl. I was, I was chasing after her. And her brother said that if I wanted to date his sister, I had to be a Christian. And up until that point, church was something that I went to occasionally, maybe on Easter, maybe at Christmas. I knew we would have a play at school and there was a little baby in the manger. And in my mind, Jesus was as real as the Easter bunny or Santa Claus. And so I just said, yeah, man, I'll, I'll accept Jesus. And, uh, you know, that was from that moment forward, God has had his hand in my life. From that moment, now there was this consciousness and can now recognize that it was the Holy Spirit saying, that's wrong. That's wrong. Now, did I listen? Absolutely not. I continued doing what I was doing, but now there was this heaviness. So after that, I ended up getting the same girl I was talking about. I got her pregnant and, uh, you know, not having a father in my life. I never wanted a kid to go through that. And so I made the decision to marry her. Now, it wasn't necessarily out of love. It was more of like, um, this is this is what a man is supposed to do. And so um, our relationship, we were 18 and 19 years old. We were just kids. And so we jumped the broom, got married and started a family, started, uh, you know, I was there raising my son, trying to do my absolute best. But behind the scenes, man, I was still smoking weed. I was still drinking, partying, going out, still fighting, still selling drugs. I made that decision. But. I hadn't taken the steps in the right direction to actually repent and change my life. But I would sit in jail for 30 days and, you know, I would kind of thumb through the Bible and I think I, this is what I got to do. And then I'd get out and the pull of the world would take me back. And so I'd be off doing the same thing immediately after, you know, it was just this cycle. It was a cycle. So at about 22 years old, maybe 23, I spent six months in jail. And at this point, I believe I had my second son. And when I got out, I just said, I'm done. I really need this change. And so um, got into a good church. And this church was extremely hands-on. We were there six days a week. There was two services on Sunday and they were different sermons. Monday was men group. Tuesday was like outreach. Wednesday was a service. You know, I mean, it was, it was involved. And so at this church, we have a revival every couple of months and an evangelist would come into town and it would be, you know, maybe three, four, five, maybe a week of different sermons and they would come in. Well, we had a seven day revival and the evangelist who was coming to this revival was known across our church as somebody who prophesies over individuals. So at the end of each night, he'll call somebody up, he'll speak into their life. And we've witnessed, you know, those prophecies come true. My prayer was that he would call me up there and give me like a financial blessing, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm two kids, I'm working in a factory. I just want an increase in finances. That's all I want. Like, Lord, I've been faithful, I'm doing good. Uh, that's not what happened. He called me up on the seventh night, the very last night of revival. I thought I was going to miss my blessing. And he says, Andrew, you have words of gold. And he says, you have been called to ministry and you're going to speak to millions of people about Jesus. And at that moment, I thought he was crazy. I thought he lost his mind. And I was so disappointed because first off, this was, you know, 2003, 2004. 
I, I didn't have millions of followers. I had MySpace at the time and I had like 13 people, which was all family members. So when he said millions of people, I thought he was crazy. Like, I don't understand how I'm going to speak to millions of people. And plus there was nothing about finances and blessing, you know, what I, what I was actually looking for. So, um, you know, to be completely honest, two, three weeks went by and I ended up leaving the church. I walked out. You know, things were tight financially and I made a decision to go back to school and uh, my pastor, my pastor wasn't with it. And he said, no, Andrew, he goes, that's not, that's not it. He warned me. He said, you've been called to ministry. He's like, you got to trust God. You got to stick with it. Like he's going to pull through. And I said, no, sir, the, the bills are real and I'm out of here. And I left the church and uh, <laughs> I went on to complete two college degrees. I played college basketball while I was away. So um, by the opinion of the world, I was succeeding. I had overcome, you know, being a statistic and just following in my family's footsteps. I graduated, had two degrees. I opened a gym and, uh, you know, ran that for about six months and, and things were looking good, but I had created this picture, this Instagram worthy picture. It was a highlight reel of what life looked like, but behind the scenes, I was very broken. I was empty. I wasn't in a good place whatsoever. And that led up to me getting in trouble and going to prison for 18 months. That was the big time, the biggest, longest time that I've ever done. And during that time, I lost everything. I lost my gym, all of these things that I had worked so hard for to achieve, these accolades and achievements, lost it all. So uh, after I got out of prison, I spent uh, the first year just trying to rebuild my life because I had gone from, you know, running a gym, making six figures, having a family to I'm just a, a single guy. After a year, I just felt like I was on the, the same track of where I was before prison. I just kind of felt myself spiraling back into that same cycle. And um, a friend of mine, we were doing a podcast and we would do a podcast. I would do the fitness and nutrition and she would bring to the table just kind of like uh, her own perspective, but she would always sprinkle in her faith. She would always talk about Jesus. And I pulled her aside one day and I was like, you know that it's not good to talk about your faith or politics when we're talking about business. And she said, if people want to unfollow me because I follow Jesus, then they're not meant to hear what I'm saying. And I was just like, that's actually a really good point. And, you know, having that faith background, I was like, I need to start praying. I need to start, you know, opening my Bible. Like I remember how whole I felt and purpose driven, even though I didn't want to go into ministry, I, I wanted to see. And so that kind of started me back into reading my word. And I started going back to church and getting a better understanding and, and finding my way back home. So after, you know, coming back to God and, and working on my own walk, I found myself a plan that I had and, and this, this vision that I had, it just fell through. It wasn't God's will. It wasn't a part of his plan and purpose for my life. And I was really lost. I was just kind of like, you know, at the end of my rope, I, I was like, what are you, what am I doing with my life? God, what is it? And so my kids at the time had talked me into getting TikTok, right? Of all things, TikTok, a, an app for kids, essentially. And so the first couple of months I look back and it was just me and them, we're dancing, we're having a good time. You know, we're just playing around, but at the end of the night, uh, one of these nights, you know, my kids weren't with me. I was dealing with my situation and I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to film a video and I'm going to post it. And it was me sharing my testimony, a 15 second video. And I didn't speak. I didn't say one word in this video. All I did was point at boxes. There was four or five boxes and it, the box said, you know, things that God has taken me through. And then I pointed at a box that said divorce, a box that said foster care, a box that said prison, and then a box that said everything else that I struggle with or something like that. And I posted it and then I went to bed and that was it. That night I went to bed with 200 followers and the next morning I woke up and there was 15,000 followers. So this video, while I went to bed, had went viral. This is the first time that I really bared my soul and shared my life instead of just being funny and cute and dancing around with my kids. And I read a couple of messages and they were just like, man, this is inspiring. Thank you for your transparency. Love the honesty. And one message said, and I was going to kill myself last night. And he said, knowing that you've gone through those things and are still here with a smile on your face gave me hope because I've gone through all of those. And at that moment, 
like I just got chills and I started, I just started crying and it was just like the Holy Spirit coming over me. And it's just like, this is what you were called to do. You know, you have words of gold, you've been called to ministry and you're going to speak to millions of people, all three of those things. And at that moment, I knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing. You look at Jonah and he's called to go to Nineveh and to do what he's supposed to do. And he's like, no, he runs. Where does he end up? He ends up in the belly of a well. And when he's in there, what does he realize? He had better go to Nineveh. And so I know that that's not about me. It's not my story, but I can relate to the fact. And here I'm called to ministry and I say, no, I'm going to run. My run, it was longer than three days. It was over a decade of sitting in the belly of a well. But on the other side of that, it's just like, okay, I get it, God. The you know, you're going to have your way in me. And so it's better for me to give you my surrendered yes. And to go after that, because that's where true life, like there's, you know, again, I, I say this after experiencing all of those things and achieving those things and having all of those things, like the, the things that everybody's like chasing after, I got those, like I had a chance to get those after having them in my hands. It's just like, yuck. That's, it doesn't like, this is what I've been chasing. This is so, it's not worth it. I'm going to, you know, I'm, God cleanse me. I'm sorry that I chased after these things. I'm sorry that I took it here. Like this is, it's disgusting. Cleanse me and, and please allow me back in. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever you say. All of the things that I thought would bring me happiness, the money, the travel, the girls, all of those things that I thought would bring me true happiness, they failed to fulfill, they failed to satisfy. I achieved those. As far as man's concerned, in our opinion, in this world, I've done all of those things. And so after doing them, I just was like, man, it's not what I thought it was. All of these things that I thought I missed out on or that were, you know, things that were holding me back or I wasn't getting to experience, I went out and did them. And nothing compares to, I can only look back and go, I was so fulfilled. I was so satisfied, so on fire and driven when I was actually serving God, when I was walking in the purpose that he had for me. Andrew wraps up his time with us by reading a passage from Jesus Calling and giving us a few closing thoughts. January 18th, I am leading you along the high road, but there are descents as well as ascents. In the distance, you see snow-covered peaks glistening in brilliant sunlight. Your longing to reach those peaks is good, but you must not take shortcuts. Your assignment is to follow me, allowing me to direct your path. Let the heights beckon you onward, but stay close to me. Learn to trust me when things go wrong. Disruptions to your routine highlight your dependence on me. Trusting acceptance of trials brings blessings that far outweigh them all. Walk hand in hand with me through this day. I have lovingly planned every inch of the way. Trust does not falter when the path becomes rocky and steep. Breathe deep droughts of my presence and hold tightly to my hand. Together, we can make it. Like I've tried to make it on my own. I've tried to do things my way. I've taken the wheel. I've thought I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I, I clawed and fought my way to the top all only to lose it all. And I realized that in my weakness, God is my strength. Christ is my strength in my weakness. In, in, my, in those moments, like he, he reveals himself. And I know that with God and with Christ, I can do anything, anything that's a part of his plan and his will. And it just reminds me that my need and dependence on God is great. It's so great. And I, I pray that I stay humble and I pray that I don't ever get to that point where I think that I can do this without him or on my own. You can follow Andrew on his TikTok channel by searching for at Andrew F. Carter or visit his website at andrewfcarterministries.org. If you'd like to hear more stories about depending on God and giving him our burdens, check out our interview with American Idol alumni, Dave Pittman. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with former Chicago news anchor and author, Diane Derby. Diane shares about conversations she would have every Tuesday with Jim Downing, one of the oldest survivors of Pearl Harbor, and how she learned what a true hero looks like. I remember asking him about being a hero, and he turned that conversation quickly around to everyone else. And it was so captivating because he was talking about here he was in this major, major event at Pearl Harbor, and yet he was turning the focus on to the heroes of today. He said, we only had to endure the bombs for a little while. 
The heroes today are up against that every day. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.